Thank you. Well, thanks a lot for the introduction, Lee, and thank you everyone here for coming to this session. My name is Yu Haoyang, and I'm a senior software engineer from the big data technology team of Intel. It's uh, exciting to have this opportunity to share some of the optimization work that we have conducted on top of Apache Spark ML Lab to efficiently support large-scale sparse data. Now, uh, I will talk first, and then Ding Ding will cover the part of large-scale logistic regression. So let's just get started. First, a little background knowledge. Is Intel, as a primary CPU manufacturer, also contributing or developing around big data technologies? The answer is yes, definitely yes. Actually, the contribution from Intel is consistent and active. We got a large and enthusiastic engineering team focusing on developing and contributing to open source big data projects. Intel is a leading contributor for quite a number of Apache projects, and we have built wide cooperation and partnership with many great companies in different industries. The typical uh, cooperation pattern is just like the graph in this page. Spark users would leverage the function and the improvements provided by Spark, and during the process, they tend to meet all kinds of issues, or they simply have some new requirements. That's when they come to us, and we would provide consultation and co-development. Co After those features are developed, tested, and benchmarked, we'll pick some of the best part and contribute it back to open source projects like Apache Spark. So there are basically two parts of my job. First is to Firstly, to provide consultation and a solution to industry Spark users. And the second part is just to contribute Spark itself. So let's get back to the topic. Sparse data is almost everywhere in the big data field, especially for large-scale machine learning applications. Uh, like two typical examples, it's movie ratings and the purchase histories. Typical users from movie ratings website would only provide comments or feedbacks for less than 10 movies. And customers for e-commerce website will typically have only bought dozens of items, even if the website is providing millions of different choices. So if we are drawing a big table containing the purchase history with each row represent the products that a customer has purchased, then we will find that the table is pretty much empty because of the significant data sparsity. And even if your original data is dense, you will probably convert them to sparse data during the feature engineering process. One example is uh, during natural language processing, NLP process, you, prob you, you may have to convert a 140 words tweet into a vector of dimension of one million or two million, depending on the vocabulary size that you used. And, uh, Another example is one hot encoder for categorical value, which will also greatly increase the dimension and the feature sparsity. It's common practice in image and video pre-processing to fade out the unrelated noise and keep up only the essential part as a sparse data vector. Okay, so currently there are two kinds of vectors supported in MRLab. One is dense vector. You can just imagine it as an array of double. And just like an array, it provides fast random access and efficient update. Yet the primary concern is memory consumption. It will have to list all the elements, even if many of them are zero. The other format is sparse vector, which focuses primarily on only the non-zero elements. So like in this example, only one and 100 are non-zero elements. So sparse vector would only need to record the indices and the values of these two numbers. As elegant and efficient as sparse vector is, still it has several shortcomings. One is that it's hard to insert or delete elements without copying those indices and values array. And the other thing is random access. To get a specific value in the sparse vector, you will have to conduct a binary search first on the indices array to get a value for a specific location. Actually, there's a third choice, hash vector. It's another kind of sparse vector backed by a hash array. Or if you are familiar with Java, you can just imagine it as a key value pair, the key being the indices and the value being the non-zero elements. And it's a, just like a hash map, it's a mutable structure. And it provides all one random exercise and update. And luckily enough, some linear operation like AXPY and, and DOT are also has a better time, time complexity. It's, 
uh, exactly the number of non-zero elements in that vector. And currently, there are two kinds of hash vector implementation. One is in Breeze already. The other is in our package. And the supporting sparse data actually has been one of the primary target of MR Lab since version 1.0. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, sparse MR Lab has already provided the load and save for sparse vectors and libSVM. Also, sp supporting sparse vector is one of the primary review focus in the community. Actually, Xiang Rui gave a great talk about sparse power. A sparse data support in Spark in the summit of 2014. I encourage you to, to take a look. Yet there are still some gaps with the actual industry scenarios. Often we got rec oh, sorry, hi, I don't can help. I'm not sure what happened. One second. Okay, they are working on it, and uh, given that we have a, time, a tight time schedule, maybe I will have to carry on. Okay, can you? Okay, maybe you can just hear what I say. <laughs> okay, uh, we often got the requirements that uh, we need logistic regression on one billion dimension. We need to conduct uh, clustering on 10 million dimension and hundreds of cluster centers, and we need large scale documents classification and clustering. Yet, with ML Lab implementation, we got OOM out of memory. So even if my data is sparse, can you do something to help? So that's why we present sparse ML. It's an independent package maintained by Intel. Contains algorithm optimization that we have conducted to support large-scale sparse data. It's open source and currently maintained by Intel, yet we are contributing many parts of it to spark, to spark itself. Currently, the list for the algorithm in sparse ML are k-means and the linear methods, including logistic regression and linear SVM. Uh, we will talk about, uh, we will talk in details about the first two in today's session. And there's an implementation of hash vector and max ABI scalar. Max ABI scalar has been merged to Spark 2.0. We also got optimization for naive base and neural network, which is still, uh, it's available in GitHub repository, but it's still working in progress. So let's get started with k-means. It's one of the most popular and fundamental classing algorithms out there. Basically, you are given a group of data points, and how can you cluster them into separate groups according to the similarities between the data points? So. If using k-means, we'll start with initial cluster centers. And the cluster centers can be randomly picked up from your data sites, or you can, you can use some specific uh, technique like k-means parallel. Then you start the iterative training process. First, uh, you would want to cluster in all the points. And uh, for each point, you, you will need to find the nearest center for it. And then you just assign that point to the center and uh, form the cluster. After all the points have identified their cluster centers, and we just recompute the center using the using all the class using all the existing clusters. So it's a iterative training process. And please note that since cluster centers are also vectors with the same dimension of data, so if you have a data of the dimension of 10 million, then your vector is also to, as a dimension of 10 million. And the customer scenario we met uh, for k-means is from an e-commerce website. They want to cluster their cu customers according to the purchase history into 200 clusters. So the data they got got 20, 20 million customers. You can just imagine them as 20 million records. And they got 10 million different products available on that website. So that, give, that gives us 10 million feature dimension. And the, the cluster number is 200. The average sparse state is 10 to minus 6. It's, that makes sense because, uh, like I said, normal uh, customers from e-commerce website would only have bought dozens of items. So let's try it with the k-means in MR Lab first. What would happen? So the first step in each iteration of k-means, uh, the cluster centers will have to be broadcasted from driver to all the workers. 
And given the dimension we have, we have 200 cluster centers, 10 million dimension each, and each double would occupy eight bytes of memory. So that combining together, all the cluster centers would take up 16G memory. And you can just imagine the process as downloading a full HD, full time, three in one, lot of rings to all of your workers using BitTorrent. Let's just hope that some worker will not get stuck at 99 percentage. And the second step is to compute a sum table for each partition of data. To get the sum of each cluster, you will have to maintain a structure. It's an array of vectors with the size of k. And for each point in that partition, you have to find the best center for it. So you have to traverse all the centers and find which is the nearest center for that point. Then after you find and after that, you just add a point to the location in the sum table. The sum table, just like the centers, is also a dense structure, which means it will take another 16G memory. So let's compute how much memory a worker needs to, compu to compute the k-means at this scope. First, it got a cluster centers broadcasted from the driver, that's 16G memory. And for each executor, it will take up an another 16G memory. And another hidden fact is that actually executor would have a local copy of the broadcasted variable. So adding up together, the worker will need, need probably 100G or more memory to compute, to compute it successfully. So how can we optimize it? Are the cluster centers necessarily to be dense? We can compute it. Let's assume the best, the worst case that all the records have no overlapping features. Then we have 20 million records, each records and 200 clusters. So each cluster would only have 0 0.1 million records. And with 10 items in each records, we'll totally have 1 million nine zero elements in the sum vector. And we have 10 million dimension. So at most, each cluster center will have a 0 0.1 center density sparsity. So the cluster centers can be sparse. Let's, next, let's check the operations in the k-means. First is AXPY, and then dot, and CQDIST. CQDIST is just a compute the square distance between two vectors. And luckily enough, we would notify that, notice that dot and SQDist are quite sparse friendly. That means uh, for square distance, actually sparse vectors would compute much faster than dense vectors, since it would only need to compute for the non-zero elements. Yet for dense vector, dense vector would have to compute for each pair of values in that vectors. Okay, another point is AXPY. XPY is not friendly for sparse vector. Yes, XPY is. We'll mention that in the next slides. So let's try to represent cluster centers with sparse vector. The purpose is just to reduce memory and time, con con time consumption from broadcasting that large of data piece. So let's check what a center goes through in each duration. First, it was broadcasted from driver to other workers. And then on each worker, it will need to be compared, computed with all the points and get the distance. And in that process, the major computation operation is CQDs and DOT, which are both sparse friendly. And then after that, the cluster center can be discarded because new centers are already generated. So seeing that process, we can conclude that cluster centers can always use sparse vectors without any extra cost or compute during the computation. There's another uh, thing that we can do is to convert all the sum table using uh, to sparse vectors. This is a little advanced topic, so if you don't follow up on that, that's fine. The target is the same, is to reduce the max memory requirement on each worker. So we use sparse vector to hold the sum table. Yet, it can be slower if you are using sparse vectors and perform the operation like AXPY because it will need to create a lot of small objects to hold the temporary, to hold the temporary result during the computation. 
even if modern GVM can handle small objects efficiently. So we provide a mechanism to automatically convert some of them to dense vector if the sparsity or the density of the records has reached the threshold. So we provide an expert parameter called sparse threshold. So uh, that's all for the sparse k-means. Basically, we just uh, turn the turn every center and some table into sparse vectors. And what if uh, actually in the major cases, your cluster centers are just uh, dense? That means that we can not leverage the sparse vector optimization anymore. And still, we want to reduce the memory consumption. And we want to break the constraint imposed by that center, by the centers and some table, which uh, takes up both 16G memory in my previous example. So the question is, can we make the centers distributed? Rather than uh, we have a centralized centers in each worker, can we make it distributed? Actually, let's try to analyze what operations it requires. Actually, for each sensor, it just needs to compute the distance for each, compute the distance for each point. So that sounds like a join operation to me. So from each point and each cluster center, you just compute their distance. So let's just make it into a join. The first step is to data and compute the caching a product with all the centers. That's, you can just imagine it as an inner join operation. And then we can compute the distance between each point and each data center. And after that, we just need to reduce by the key. The key here is a point. So for each point, we need to find the nearest center of it. So the reduce by key operation is pretty simple. We just need to find the smallest distance and keep it as that. So we got the first variable point with center. So for each point, we got the center and we got the smallest distance it can get. And after we get that structure, we can just map uh, in the in the second uh, in the second phrase that uh, we can just convert it using a map function from point center dist to center point and one, and then we just reduce according to the center. So we can get the sum or average value of all the points allocated to that center. So that's the scalable k-means. That's all in it. Actually, this is a far more scalable way than the current implementation of ML, uh, k-means in ML lab. This is a completely scalable operation, uh, com complete, completely scalable solution. There's no need for broadcast. There's no need for some table. Actually, if originally you need a 200G memory, you need a single node with 200G memory, you now only need 20G memory on each node and you just need 10 servers. So that removes a memory constraint on a single node. And this optimization is not only for sparse data. Actually, if you check the operation here, none of them require them that data is sparse. So, uh, let's sum it up. For sparse k-means, the optimization way is that we find that cluster centers can actually be sparse. So we use sparse vectors to uh, represent the centers and the sum table. And if that not work, we can just uh, switch to scalable k-means, which totally remo removes the constraint imposed by the k-means centers, by the centralized k-means centers and sum table and make it a more distributed, scalable way. So another tip before Dining comes up is uh, if you want to do some feature engineering with sparse data, please use Max ABI Scaler. Because the other, the other two scaler uh, in ML Lab is MiMax Scaler and Standard Scaler. They will both destroy the sparsity of your data. So if you are dealing with sparse data, please use Max ABI Scaler. Next, please welcome my colleague Ding Ding to present the part about logistic situation. Thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to our session. I'm Ding Ding. I'm senior software engineer at Intel. And uh, I will introduce the work we did 
in large-scale logistic regression on Spark. First, I would like to quickly go through the workflow of logistic regression on Spark. Uh, the data will be loaded from that system and uh, at the start of each iteration, driver will broadcast the weights to each executor and the tasks will compute its local gradient based on the weights and the cache training data. And then local gradient will be sent back to the driver for aggregation and at last driver will compute a new weight. Uh, this is one of our customer's training set. Uh, it has 200 millions of unique features uh, with billions to trillions training samples and each sample has hundreds to thousands non-zero elements. It's a large big data, it's a large training set and a large data model. During training, it has many performance issues. Uh, due to time limitation, I will skip the, this slide as uh, its analysis, why, why, there, uh, why it causes performance issue. Uh, we did three optimizations, and our first optimization is exploiting sparsity in gradients. Uh, as we know, as we know, gradient is a function of x transpose w and times x. x is the current training point, and w is weight vector. Um, we can see here the gradient is sparse as the feature vector is sparse. So we switch to sparse gradients. Um, for all points, for each point, we compute its gradient, and then we do a reduce uh, get uh, added, uh, we can sum it up and uh, get some of gradient. Here we use hash sparse vector as our gradient. Uh, in each partition, we create a new hash sparse vector. And after we compute the gradient, we add it directly to the hash sparse vector. In this way, we can have very fast random access and it's much more memory friendly than dense vector. In our customer scenario, uh, the gradient in our executor has been reduced from 10 gigabytes to around 200 megabytes. It significantly reduced the memory in each executor. Uh, the second optimization we did is exploiting sparsity in weights. Uh, in our customer's scenario, weights is with great sparsity as many features are not used during the training. It's wasteful if we store in so many zero, so we remove them and use dense vector with non-zero elements to store the weights. Uh, for example, there are 12 buckets. Uh, the index is the feature ID and the bucket with the solid field means it has non-zero values. If we use a dense vector of size 12 to store weights, it's, uh, it will be waste lots of memory. In, uh, instead, we use a dense vector of, of size 4 to store it, as there are only four non-zero values. Besides, we use a <coughs> sorry. Besides, we use another array to store the feature ID whose value is non-zero. Here we can see uh, feature feature one, two, five, eleven is not uh, the value is non-zero. So we installed them in another array, and we renamed the index of the array as global index, and the array is named as global to feature ID mapping. How do we get the global to feature ID mapping? Uh, for each partition, we compute its local index to feature ID, which I will introduce in the following slides, and then we do a collect and after that, we do a flat map to get an array. At last, we use a distinct to get the unique features. And during our training, only global index is used. And after training, we will convert it back to feature ID by the mapping. The third optimization we, do, we did is optimizing cached training data. The first step we did is use local index as sparse vector indices instead of feature ID. Uh, for each parti when loading data from fast system for each partition, 
uh, we create a dense vector to store the mapping from local index to feature ID. The index is the local index and the value is the feature ID and we cached the local index in training data. For example, uh, this, this, is, this is one partition and there are four points and, and uh, the following is their feature IDs. Uh, after loading data from file system, uh, we get a local to feature ID mapping and its size is a unique feature number in this partition. And, and, and point one has been changed to zero, one, two, three. As, as, uh, as zero, the index, the local index is zero and the one's local index is one and the nine's local index is two and 24's local index is three. Uh, after the, after the re-index, uh, the, the indecisis of the sparse vector can be significantly reduced as uh, in our customer scenario, the local index has been reduced from 200 minions to around two minions. After that, we can compress the local index. As we all know, int is, int is used to store the feature ID with four bytes, and it's a waste of memory if we use a, if we use a int to store value that, are, that is smaller than two minions. So we use every byte here. Uh, and uh, we use two, we use one to three bytes to store the local index. So the indices is, uh, is updated from every int to every, every byte. However, every, every byte is also memory costly. So we change it to every byte and we use the first bit to identify if the following byte is a new local index. We also support for binary values. Uh, when we load parsing data, if the feature value is zero, we will not store it. If the feature value is one, we will store the feature ID in a dense vector. And otherwise, we will store both indices and values in a sparse vector. Uh, in this example, uh, feature zero's value is one, so we store zero in a dense vector. And since uh, feature one and feature six value is not binary, we store them in a sparse vector, and since uh, feature nine's value is one, we also store it in a dense vector. We tested our new implementation in our cluster. There are 12 executors with eight gigabyte memory each, and there's auto memory in Spark logistic regression, and in our new implementation, each apple can be finished in 19 seconds. Uh, our library can be found at this site and its consistent interface with MLlib and it compiled with application code. That's all for, uh, that's all for my part, thank you. <laughs>